Rock and roll was once the most popular genre of music in the world. If you include underground music, some people would argue it still is the most popular genre. But when it comes to mainstream popularity, EDM, hip hop, and pop have surpassed rock and roll. Hip hop is the biggest genre of music in the world, by far. If you ask a kid in today's time, they will always see hip hop always is popular. They, they don't know rock. You are one of the biggest names in EDM. In your mind, why do you think EDM has just exploded the last 10 years or so? Mm. It's very worldly because it's uh, many times instrumental based. And that, of course, you know, that connects people all around the world. I always say Tiesto played the Olympics for a reason back in the day. Rock is dead. That's a statement that has been repeated over and over and over again the last several years. When you hear the term rock is dead, what does that mean to you? Yeah, the term rock is dead, I, um, it upsets me <laughs> because all of my main influences and all the music that I feel so much connection to from my, from my school days and growing up, you know, Garbage, Pearl Jam, Nirvana, Soundgarden, I don't want to think that that music is over. My name is Daniel Sarkissian. I'm a 27-year-old filmmaker, and a couple of years ago, I made a documentary called What is Classic Rock? It's a, it's a very broad term, um, but like if you say to me what's classic rock, what band is classic rock, I can pinpoint it to you. But you know, to de try to describe the actual genre, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know what really classifies a band as classic rock. I just know what it is. You know, and I think everybody's got a different viewpoint of what classic rock is. Tough question, like what is the blues? What is classical music? What is classic rock? I think you made people nervous when you said, you know, uh, what do you think classic rock yeah, is? Yeah, I know. Is it? <laughs> Thankfully, the film was well received. So to anyone who supported what is classic rock, I want to say thank you. It did very well. And the purpose of the film essentially was to find a definition for the term classic rock. At the end of the film, I did have an answer. But I also was left with a question. Why are people saying that rock is dead? Yeah, I don't, I have heard people say that rock is dead. I don't, I, I don't buy that. I mean, they can't, they haven't killed ska. How are they going to kill rock, you know? Do you guys think that rock and roll can ever get to a point where it's at the top of the industry again or top of the mainstream music? Absolutely. Anything can. And um, I think that's kind of the vision. So I think it's time to make a new movie. Just like with What is Classic Rock, I'm making this film entirely on my own without any film crew, any funding. It's just me and my love of rock and roll. This is the bridge in Aberdeen, Washington, where, according to Nirvana folklore, Kurt Cobain was asleep when he was a homeless teenager. According to most Nirvana biographers, however, Kurt Cobain didn't actually sleep here, even though he did spend a lot of time underneath the bridge. Regardless of what's myth and what's reality, this location has become one of the quintessential pilgrimage sites for Nirvana fans. And while I was here, 
I met a local man who showed me the exact location where Kurt Cobain is said to have slept. That's where he slept over there. Wow. So you're from Aberdeen, you said, right? Yep. So right up the road. do people come here all the time? It's like a pilgrimage? All the time. As a matter of fact, on his birthday, you'll find a lot of people that come down here on his birthday to pay homage to him. Nirvana were huge. You know, they were a worldwide phenomenon. I mean, I was just... Um, on vacation actually in California and I saw we saw quite a few Nirvana t-shirts um, still you know and it's what is it 2019 one of the reasons that people have been saying that rock is dead is because in the past 25 years or so there have only been a handful of new rock bands to achieve massive success and one of the last truly iconic rock stars is Kurt Cobain. I'm here in Seattle right now on the 25th anniversary of his passing at Ferretta Park. There are people here from Finland, Brazil, Mexico, Chile, France, Belgium, all over the world here to commemorate his memory. You know, I think that Nirvana connected to me on a real emotional level. Uh, I, I look at back at some of the pictures I've took. It was a real, real emotional release. And I think Kurt and I shared some of the same experiences of dysfunctional family growing up and divorce and um, chronic pain. Did you guys uh, ever talk about that stuff? Uh, we talked a little bit about it. There were connections there and I think that's the lasting uh, what what is lasting about Kurt and his legacy is that is that emotional connection. The first time I actually met Kurt was um, Chris Novoselic and Tracy and Bruce Pavitt came by my apartment in Belltown and picked me up. And oh, and Kurt was there, and um, Chad Channing was the drummer. Then we drove down to uh, Tacoma and took photos at the Tacoma Narrow Bridge. So, anyways, that was the first day I met Kurt. We were friends. We had a lot in common, like he was pretty sensitive. But what I would say just having been his friend and having been in that scene is I would think that he would be kind of embarrassed about all the sort of deification that's happened to him. Because I think he just felt like a human, you know, like a kind, hardworking, passionate human. That's Kurt, baby. So how long did uh, Kurt live here? Like, how old was he? Man, he must have been 12, 13. I broke his arm one time. You broke his arm once? <laughs> <laughs> what happened there? Well, we were farting around. Oh, jeez. I was shooting him up with my feet up in the air. And shot him a little too high, he came down and broke his arm. <laughs> On the very first day at the studio, um, someone came in with a manila envelope full of legal documents that they all had to sign. This is a lawsuit where somebody had a band called Nirvana and he wants to get paid off because your band is called Nirvana. Okay, here, fine. This is so they can use a photograph of you on a magazine cover to promote this thing. Okay, whatever. Beginning in the late 1880s, phonograph records of musical performances became commercially available to the public. Combined with the widespread usage of radio broadcasting starting in the 1920s, the music industry entered a new era. Thus, the record labels, the companies who published, manufactured, and distributed recorded music to the radio broadcasters, they became the most powerful entities in the music industry.
this is the location of the first ever music billboard. On August 18, 1966, The Doors signed with Elektra Records, and for the next several months, preparations began for The Doors' first album. On January 4, 1967, The Doors' self-titled debut record was released. Jack Holzman, president of Elektra Records, decided to have a billboard of The Doors placed by the Chateau Marmont. Holzman believed that local DJs would notice the sign on their way to the Sunset Strip just down the road. Some of the most famous clubs in Los Angeles are located at the Sunset Strip, including the Whiskey A Go Go, the venue where The Doors used to be the house band. And since then, billboards have become a standard practice in the music business. The 60s and 70s are largely known for experimental music. The 80s are largely known for music videos. With the introduction of music videos, the biggest change is that it all came, became very quickly about image. On August 1st, 1981, MTV was launched, ushering in the age of music videos. I worked for a record company and at that time, and we would go out and look for bands. Instead of the questions being about, well, how did they sound, or what was their writing like, or was it was like, well, what they look like? You know, that was immediately something that became a huge thing because what people realized was pretty quickly was like, hey, if they don't have songs, well, we can get them some songs. If they can't play that well, well, we can use some session guys in the studio to make the record. So that became a big thing. It's like, well, but if we got you know, guys that are great performers and look great, we can build every, we can fix everything else around it. I think one of the things that's happened to music as, as, as time has gone on and as we've gotten, you know, headed towards the end of the 20th century and coming into the 21st, one of the things that's happened is, um, you know, that, that the musical side of things became somewhat diluted, and I, I hesitate to say this, but I, I don't want to, I can't blame any one thing, but MTV didn't help that much because it put more of an emphasis on how somebody looks or what's the video like and how's, how's it presented and how's it, how does it look? How does that music look? <laughs> so the visual of what MTV did uh, and how, how impactfully that sold records, which I witnessed firsthand, is something that completely turned the industry on its head. By the mid to late 80s, a new musical movement was starting to develop in Seattle. A movement which was partly in reaction against the MTV image first kind of music that was being put out there. This movement was grunge. And one of the people at the center of this movement was producer Jack and Dino. Well, I felt like I was right in the middle of a, of a sort of a little renaissance of rock that was going on here in Seattle. Um, you know, I was right in the engine room, as it were, and I don't think anyone expected, I don't think any of us expected that, you know, four or five Seattle bands would suddenly be, you know, up in the upper reaches of the Billboard album charts, you know, by 1991, 1992. And the beauty of what happened in the Northwest was we were isolated. So, you know, if everyone would have been trying to get a record label in Los Angeles, uh, when they were first starting out, maybe they would have been more homogenous. But here, everybody got to do their own thing because it was a punk rock standard. There was a brief period, there have been several brief periods where different idiomatic elements of the underground or the legitimate music scene have been brought to the surface and have been sort of skimmed by that industry, the mainstream industry. And that sort of culminated with Nirvana becoming the biggest band in the world. When they became successful to, on an on a international scale and became a huge phenomenon, then that sort of started a feeding frenzy with the big record labels, where the big record labels were trying to find a, other 
like unpolished gems in the underground music scene that they could turn into commodities like that. I was doing pretty well on account of all the records I'd done from the grunge era, meaning the Mud Honey records, the Tad records, the Soundgarden record. The Bleach record has had somewhat of a reappraisal. I've heard rumors that you were considered to work on in utero. Is this true? You know, there were rumors about it, but I never heard anything directly from the band. And in fact, the first time I talked to Kurt about it, he told me that he was planning on recording with Steve Albini. So I thought, well, that puts that to rest. Nirvana were, were peers. We were sort of of the same scene. They, they were in an unusual circumstance in that they had gotten famous, you know. But I still considered them peers. I considered, considered them part of the same circle that we had all grown up in. So working with Nirvana was not intimidating in that respect. The, the pressure that they were under like was it was immediately apparent to me that they were in a different world in that regard when you recorded in utero back in 1993 what exactly was the issue with nirvana's label long story short the band recorded the album in utero by hiring me directly so i was never contractually bound to their record company in any way that was a break in the paradigm of the way record companies wanted to do business. Record companies wanted to be the responsible party so that they could exert control over situations by withholding payment or demanding things or, you know. If your business depends on you exerting control over the people you work with and one of those people has a successful record that doesn't obey that protocol, it's a dangerous precedent. I immediately started getting calls from journalists who were getting leaks from the record company. And one of those phone conversations was, um, I just got off the phone with Gary Gersh. He says he can't release the new Nirvana album and it's your fault. Would you like to comment? <laughs> there was an effort to shut down that record and make the band do it again. The band dug in their heels to an extent. They said, no, this is the record. We like the record. We want to release it. There were two or three songs that were remixed, but the record that ended up in the stores is the record the band wanted people to hear. And they released a record that they were proud of. Well, it was, I mean, at the time I was, it was the early 90s. And I was, when, when I when it was going into high school, I was, I was 14. So Nirvana was massive at the time. They, I think they'd just come out with the In Utero. That was the first real style of music I really got into because it was so influential back then. And, you know, it was a different thing than today. It, that's another thing about today is you don't get these bands um, like Nirvana where everyone starts dressing like them. You know, everyone, as soon as Nirvana came out, everyone had to have like the blonde hair down to the shoulders plaid this whole thing it was like a whole movement of not just like i love this band but i want to look like this band um, do you think that's possible anymore with the internet and how everything's so dispersed i don't see it anymore like do you still get like your punks and your you know your goths and like your metal guys and they all kind of look you can kind of say oh that guy probably listens to heavy metal by the way he dresses um but you don't really get this thing of like a, a, a person looking like a band like, you know, like everyone looked like Kurt Cobain at my school. You know, there's a lot of people that had their hair long and wore red plaid and ripped jeans and, you know, and they, everyone's trying to look like Kurt Cobain. And I don't, I don't really see that anymore. For the better part of 70 years or whatever, there was a music business that was essentially the record business. So the record business model meant that there was a kind of a, a singular thrust to the industry. And so you had phenomenon bands, massive artists who put out many albums and all of them were heard by everybody, essentially, right? That's gone. There is no singular focus on selling records now. So there isn't a singular industry that is promoting things in the same way. Now you have just like YouTube and Spotify and all these streaming things, Apple Music and all this stuff. How are you going to get someone to be like, here's this new thing, everyone love it? After around the year 2000, and now this is, this is I, have to, I have to point this out. Sure. Uh, I had made, you know, probably a couple hundred records already by the time the year 2000 came about. And 
97% of everything I recorded, period, everything, got released by some indie label somewhere during that period. I'm just as busy as ever, but now it's like, you know, 5% of the records I do come out on any sort of indie label. Come the 2000s and the internet came, all that started to go away, exponentially so. It was like every couple of years the sales halved, and they halved, and they halved. And not just for me, that was the same for literally everybody other than maybe Michael Jackson or whatever, you know. If you were coming out today, would you approach things differently than you did in the late 90s, early 2000s? Hard to say. I think, you know, when we were coming up, we were pretty, like, we were doing YouTube stuff before YouTube. Like, we were... Half we, our power thing, right? Yeah, like, we'd have, but we'd have to go to, like, the, you know, we'd have to get these VHS tapes uh, printed up and, like, carry boxes of VHS tapes to our show and, you know, hand out, hand them out, hand them out at Warp Tour and all this stuff. So if there was YouTube back then, it would have been so much easier. The thing is, you know, we were a big radio band back then, and radio, there's not as many rock radio stations in general anymore. Um, and you know, it's, it's almost become, I don't want to say irrelevant, but in a way it kind of has because, you know, with, with streaming services and stuff like that, it's not, radio doesn't dictate what's big anymore. Mm -hmm. And it used to like MTV and radio was like, if you got on those things, you're, and you were, you know, number one on rock radio, you were probably going to do pretty well. I think it's really unlikely that there will be a single sort of generational artist in the way that there was with someone like Frank Sinatra or the Beatles, you know. I won't even talk about the Beatles. I'll talk, let's go to the 80s, talking about U2, Metallica, Guns N' Roses. Uh, they were selling millions and millions and millions of records. It, that doesn't happen anymore. You know, you had thousands of bands selling millions of records. Now you have millions of bands selling thousands of records. I think unless you're one of the top rock bands in the world that can survive um, just through shows, there's no record sales there to sustain bands to, that want to just keep touring just for the love of it. So really you have to make your money out of touring now. If you're going to be making music and you're doing that as a main source of your income, you have to be making the money from touring. Cheers. 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 Can I get you guys to show me a little bit of the tour bus? Sure. That'd be cool. Um, it's fairly luxurious. This is one of our bunk mates, Kenny. What's up? You're on camera. <laughs> I saw you guys have a PlayStation. Are you guys yeah. gamers? Three uh, PlayStations. Three PlayStations. Yeah, three and what do you play? Oh, man. Let's see. Red Dead, Red Red Dead Redemption. Redemption 2. That game's everywhere. God of War. Mortal, Mortal Kombat. Kombat happened last night. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know you guys played that one. Last That's night. about it so far. Winter tours, there's more gaming than summer tours. Summer tours, you're, you go outside and you exactly. do stuff. But when it's go negative, outside and ride yeah. bikes. It's yeah. Funny. Well, you're winter in Canada. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. So what's behind door number one? Oh uh, yeah, it's pretty good. You can turn the light on. Oh cool. So this is where you guys sleep. Yeah. Yeah. When you sleep on the bus, all the bunks are right next to each other. Yeah. When you're all in bed, it feels like oftentimes you're camping, mm -hmm. and you're just and, and as long as you look at it. Not like you're camping, but in the sense, with that same viewpoint, it's it's just like your home. That's how you make it yeah. at home. That's like awesome. yeah, like I that's said, the goal to make it home. We're on the road what, eleven months out of the year, so yeah. you know everything that you can do to make it more enjoyable, you have to. Is there another interview at the back? No, of course. Yeah. They're filled. Adam, Daniel, nice to meet you, man. Cheers. That's pretty much it. It's like the size of a. You know, stu small studio apartment. We got twelve people living on it for six Jeez. weeks. Uh, Who's the best uh, Mortal Kombat player? That's important. Uh, Kenny says he is, and I, I think I believe. Well, him. I used to play a lot when I was eleven. Okay. Um, and I haven't played since then, but I think the muscle memory is there. <laughs> so um, I would assume that I'm the best. I don't actually know, but I, I would assume that I'm the best. You'd be so I'm good. Awesome. Like, <laughs> what's that guy saying? The financial structure, the economics of the music business have changed. There are less people investing their time towards being in a band because it's more financially practical to approach being a solo artist. The money in music just disappeared once all the major labels started to kind of condense. Um, the money for shows just wasn't enough to support bands that have got six or seven people touring and a sound guy. So it's just, yeah, it's not kind of viable. Part of the reason you switched over to electronic music is because the rock scene was not as prominent. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You were in a band with your brother at one point in time. Yeah. Um, is it, what's it like working with your, your family? 
Like, oh, it's, it's great. You know, I mean, it's a double-edged sword. Of course, we can fight <laughs> a lot and, you know, have our arguments. But with family, you're always, you always can trust the other person. We know what each other is thinking without having to say it. If I write an idea that I'll know whether he likes it or not immediately because we've always written together. Um, also, there's no there's no pleasantries there. You know, if one of us writes an idea the other doesn't like, it's, you know, you, don't, you can just cut through all of that and, and get to the point. So it's great. It's, we've always worked really, really well together. And now my brother is the more organized of us and I get to tour and do, and do this side of things while he takes care of the business side. So it's very symbiotic. What is the reality of life on the road like? Well, life on the road is obviously not as glorious as people think, okay? Um, and it's all relative to what you do and, and what's going on, you know. Obviously, my KISS years, um, where everything was first class and as convenient as possible, was less difficult than, you know, you got a van and a trailer and you got to drive the night after the gig, you know, to get to the next gig. It's the most consistently inconsistent job in the entire world. You never know what the next day is going to be. For example, Tonight we're going to leave at 10 p.m. and we're going to go from here in Toronto to New York City. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to do about six hours of press. We're going to go home for four days, which is probably the four days out of the four weeks of the year that we're going to be home. What are the realities of being famous? That's fun. <laughs> You're a lot away from home and you don't have routine. I think routine is one thing that gets difficult. It's difficult being on the road without... It's hard to build a routine, you know, like you're in different time zones. It's like all over the place. This one, I did tour with this one for All Killer and, and I think for the beginning of this Look Infected and then yeah, I started using it on every album. Touring around the world, I mean we've played in all the biggest festivals around the world, you know, Japan's Summer Sonic and, you know, Germany's Rock and Ring, Rock and Park and there's Download Festival, UK, we've, it's like all these big rock festivals and they are still like rock festivals. Like, that's why I really don't think rock is actually dead because if you get these festivals in Europe and they're bringing 60 to 100,000 people, there's no way that you could say rock is dead because if that many people want to see it, it's obviously alive and well. Thank you. Woohoo! Every once in a while, my friends and I go to big rock festivals and we have an amazing time. There are thousands and thousands of people gathered together simply to enjoy rock and roll. So how could rock be dead? Direct your attention to stage center. I've said this before, it may be slightly unpopular, but to me, like, it's like the festival, the music festival has been the death knell of, of rock and roll. Really? You think so? Yeah, because it, it used to be you had to create a scene with clubs and man, like this, you know, you didn't just get to go to an all day thing. It's really about the experience of the festival. It's not necessarily about the music. It, it's more of a, just a spring break commodification kind of thing versus like, oh wow, I'm going because this band is going to change the world, you know? I think maybe people also think rock is dead because it's harder for new rock bands to become big. If you were from about 10 years ago and on, and you came up, or even 15, um, and you came up in the world of when record labels had um, still had money and they're giving big budgets and big, you know, th hundreds of thousands of dollars for music videos and stuff like that. Um, then I think, you know, you're, and you came up in that era and were able to be successful, then you're probably still successful now. But from about 2000, I don't know, eight, nine, ten on, it's become really hard for rock bands to become, because they don't have the budgets anymore. Like yeah. they don't have the, prom they don't have the marketing money. It's like all self-promotion now. What's the importance, if there is an importance, of community amongst bands? Yeah, I think I think it is important. Like because you get 
especially for older bands to help out young bands because it is really hard for young bands to 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 break nowadays so you need to for if you're an established older band and you can go on these good tours and bring a good crowd i think it's important to be able to bring these young bands and you know give them years to play in front of Been in this business for a long time. What's the craziest thing that's happened to you? Well, something you may not be aware of was I was uh, actually shot. Uh, a bullet went through my leg on Sunset Boulevard years ago. CNN, you know, former Kiss guitarist Bruce Kulick shot on Sunset Boulevard. You know, suffered gunshot wounds. Okay, you know, they were actually kind of ricochets of bullets from someone shooting up the street. Um, and then I went out and it felt like a hot poker went through my leg and I kind of went in shock pretty quickly. Um, but I, 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 I was a little like, what's going on? You know, it was like very surreal. The other bullet actually glazed my ear. And people would say like, oh man, you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. No, I was really actually in the right place at the right time. Why do you feel that way? Because two inches I would have been dead or crippled. Do you believe in God? I believe in God in a, in a, in my own way, because I think it has to be very specific for everyone. You could say your fate and what determines fate. These are things are, that there's... Well, I'll go on about that for hours. But yeah, <laughs> right, right. And, and anyone could. And it's the same thing with my fate as a musician, though, you know, to tie it into that. I had a great opportunity that I was professional enough and ready for to be, you know, the guitarist of Kiss. And, and my singer needs to warm up. <laughs> this wood is from 1961 <laughs> so it's like it's seen some some stuff that's really cool are yeah. you taking that on tour with you i don't know <laughs> how do you balance being in a huge band and also having a family life it's well it's new to me because while well, my son's three and everyone's conscious of um you know kids and stuff now uh so you know flying them out um, you know, to with the internet now, like FaceTime is a big thing. Um, so it's just kind of stuff like that and just making sure like, you know, tours don't run <laughs> excessively yeah. long. How have your lives changed since becoming famous? I don't think we ever knew that we had so many friends before, before we started doing this. And yeah. then we were on the road and we're like, man, yeah, sure. yeah, everybody, <laughs> everybody's just coming out of the woodwork. It eats at your soul a little bit. Yeah. In what sense? It's a little bit draining to know that it's not that a little bit draining to have people gravitate towards you, not because of who you are, but what you are. The perception of what we do is totally off from what the reality is. Yeah. What is and the reality, then, if I may ask? Well, the reality is some days you're, how do I put it? Some days you're literally jet skiing in the Middle East, and um, some days you're eating cold ramen noodles from a hotel bathroom. At the time of this recording, you guys have well over 145 million YouTube hits. Does going viral on YouTube automatically translate into financial success? What's the reality of being viral? If you break down what YouTube pays out per view, and then you put that through a record company deal, percentage deal that we're getting, it's, you know, those numbers look very good. When you see a hundred million or almost fractions, views, fractions of a yeah, cent, fractions that you're getting paid. paid. Yeah. Rock as a business is uh, going through the toughest times it's ever been through. You know, our, our artists and musicians have to think of new ways to make a living. Um, is this the internet's fault? Yeah, it is. It is. Um, I think, you know, obviously when Napster came around in the late 90s, or early 2000s, there was a big stink about it. From your vantage point as a musician, what was it like experiencing the whole Napster saga unfold? 
Uh, it was scary at first because um, you, you know everybody saw the decline of the, of the physical sales, and um, I, I always was uh, leery about it because I, even if I wanted to download stuff, I wouldn't. But the whole uh, virus thing back then—you go into a lot of these sites and you get a virus, and when you could have just spent ten bucks and bought the record, you know. What are your thoughts on internet piracy? I've said publicly that I reject the term piracy. Uh, people listening to music is people listening to music. It's not piracy. They're not stealing anything. They're not taking anything. They're not damaging an asset. They're listening to music. If anything, they're broadening the audience for it. And the people who make the music, if they're savvy, will find out ways to exploit that newly broadened audience. So I can see why Steve Albini would say that. Um, because the cost of getting your music out is now almost zero. But actually getting people to listen to it in the sea of data that we're you know confronted with on the internet that's really the tricky hard the hard part people that actually literally just take the music for free i mean that, that's that's what's killed the industry i mean that's you know the, there's like i said when, when i was coming out with dream theater back 30 years ago in the mid 80s you know you you know you sell a million records then Nowadays, a brand new band will come out and sell 500 units. Like Internet piracy. How has that affected your career? This is the best thing ever. In what sense? <laughs> Why? Uh, no, I think it's really good because, uh, you know, I want to get the content to the people. If you would tell me my record would sell a million copies legally or a billion illegally, give me a billion illegally. <laughs> Listen, the cops are going to see this, so... Yeah, please. Okay, fantastic. Cool. It's my music. If your goal is to just get your music heard, well then, uh, you know, you have greater outlets than ever before. Uh, so in that respect, it's the internet's been a great thing. There are players like Spotify and YouTube and Bandcamp that have an extraordinary reach and influence in the same way that MTV and Much Music and the, you know, the corporate radio station networks did, used to have. And will radio even be around in 20 years? I mean, maybe there won't be radio, and maybe it's not going to matter. You're going to just have your own little private streaming device to play for you whatever you want. You're not going to have to rely on someone else's determination of what they may consider the music that you think you're supposed to like. Not a lot of money changes hands. And that is the thing that the people, the remnants of the old music industry, the sort of dinosaurs that rail against how terrible the, inter the Internet is, those people are bemoaning the fact that people can now indulge their music interests for free. You can't separate piracy anymore from just the way the internet works, which is it's digital. You know, it's coming from a server to your computer. That's a copy. And one other thing that people forget about the, um, the era before the internet is you couldn't actually make a copy of anything. Uh, you couldn't do a safety copy. You could make a safety copy by copying from a tape to another tape. However, the backup tape would have twice as much tape hiss and it would not sound exactly the same as the original tape. You literally couldn't make an exact backup of anything before the digital world. Digital data is infinitely copyable and that the way the internet works can't really be put back in the bottle. Of course people are going to listen to music for free. Why would people pay for things that they can get free? There is no argument for it. The, the, the residual music industry wants to sort of guilt trip the entire universe into giving them money just because they were used to being paid for something. And it's absurd. I 100% agree that piracy has actually helped some artists in the fact that now you can make money from touring. Um, it's just changed the way you have to flip the way that you look at it. So that's why I changed to electronic music as opposed to rock music. Because, um, yeah, we weren't selling albums with the band. But I realized that, okay, if I can put electronic music out there and have people in Egypt or Amsterdam or anywhere in the world watching it on YouTube, then there's the opportunity to tour to these places. So instead of selling albums, you're selling tickets. There are thousands of stories like that. Like bands discovering that they have a, a following in a distant place and then going there and being like welcomed like heroes. Bands whose careers in a in an active sense, were relatively short, are seeing their recordings 
survive and get de- disseminated and their audience grow and their following grow such that a band that has been defunct for 20 or 30 years can often now mount a, a successful reunion tour because their music has been able to percolate out into an audience that, that would support it. Whereas previously, when it was kept at bay by the gatekeepers of the radio stations and the record stores and the professional music industry, the, their music could never break through that. Their music could never get into the hands of people who would like it, and now it can't. We saw like the show on Friday, but this is like New York, a place where I haven't done any like marketing or whatsoever, but people follow you know, people are very particular about what they like. Is that because like. of the internet, do you think? Of course, the internet plays a very big role, you know. How has the internet changed the business, in your opinion? It has changed the business for the better. You can be anywhere in the world, as long as you're releasing the music to the net, and long, as long as you're telling your story, as long as you're feeding the people the right messages about you, they'll catch it. Black Coffee is the biggest DJ from South Africa. I discovered him through the internet. Because of the internet, I've discovered artists that otherwise I may not have been able to. I think that piracy has helped a lot of artists that wouldn't, like myself really, that in dance music I wouldn't have ever been able to tour the Middle East or Amsterdam or all of these countries that I go to all the time now because I have songs that people watch on YouTube. People can find your music for free, which is amazing. If there's someone has no money, I'm pleased if the person can have my music for free, why not? If you use internet right, you, you, if you filter the good information you really want to know, if you're not lost in it, it's perfect. It's, it changed the world, and I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Ellen is one of the biggest DJs from Germany. She's also someone that I discovered online. Social media is a fantastic tool. But in my opinion, social media is also one of the main reasons why a lot of music today has become very hollow. A lot of music that's released today, you can tell immediately it's created simply for mass consumption. It's not created really for an artistic expression of the artist. If you're looking at this strictly as a business and you just want to do it as a business and make money, then, hey, that's awesome. Good for you. But that's not being an artist. Yeah, totally. I think that it's just completely distorts the image of what art is. And then I think people are so caught up and, you know, I think what was so cool about rock and roll is that Back then, it was kind of social media. There was no, you know, easy form of communication. You had to travel and you had to meet people and you had to, you had to embrace it. <laughs> it's, it's totally back and forth, well, I would say, with, with social media. As far as it goes, I mean, I don't think any of us like doing it. Will anyone ever figure it out? Yeah, maybe. Well, probably not us. <laughs> For me, I feel like, on the one hand, social media is cool because you get to see what you're favorite band is me. On the other hand, there's this one musician I really liked. And when I learned he had Instagram, the mystery's gone. Yeah. I know what you're doing every day. You know, for us, it was like the punk scene was mysterious. You couldn't just go Google like, oh, see all of the top of the pops until you like vomited. No, it was like, wow, dude, somebody's got like this VHS of like some British punk stuff and you watch it on the TV going like this. You know, we live a little bit in an age of a hyperinflation with the internet, where everything is available on your iPod 24 hours a day, and people are flooding themselves with all this kind of stuff. And when I was young, um, it was not so. You know, we had maybe a cassette recorder, we could maybe have our favorite songs, but it was much more a touchy feely thing. A song back then or now meant a lot more. You know, nowadays the throughput is, is just so fast. I always like to talk about how Nirvana and the grunge movement was the last big music music movement pre-internet, pre kind of the, the digital information age. You know, everything suddenly just centralized instead of like, the, it took a lot of the kind of the mystery out of it. What do you think about that? Like specifically the mystery part of music, is it disappearing? Yes. You know, the, of course, uh, the, I mean, if you mean the mystery of the artist as such, some uh, artists have very pronounced um, feelings about that. We live in a very voyeuristic society today where a value is placed on overexposing everything about your life online. 
And in terms of music, one of the interesting reactions that has happened to this digitization of music is the increase in vinyl record sales. Vinyl records have actually been doing quite well the last several years. Look at the resurgence of, of uh, vinyl as a format, which I find is extraordinary. I, I couldn't personally wait for vinyl to disappear and for CDs to arrive um, uh, because I was such an audiophile. But to me, it, it, it's a sign that people, especially kids, are in need of something real, something physical. Vinyl being, being up there as a format, it's incredible. I would never believe vinyl would come back. But it has, you know, on this, I mean, I know 17 year old kids who are buying Zeppelin 2 and Deep Purple in Rock and uh, Pink Floyd The Wall for massively inflated prices. But they're buying them because they're they want, it. they're still doing it because they want something physical. They want artwork, all the stuff that we loved when we were kids. Um, to me, it, it, it's, it's a natural, um, not progression, it's a natural return. I think it's like it's like with with whole foods. It's like with, with proper food. People want to be nourished by the real thing. There's still to me. There's nothing better than standing in front of a band, like being consumed in the experience, and buying the vinyl, buying the CD. Which CDs are probably going to be gone in you know coming years, but. Just holding the music and, and letting it being like a tangible thing. So, but you know, social media has its pros and its cons. You know, it's it's not the 70s anymore, so we kind of have to stay with the times. Does the social media culture misportray what it means to be a musician? That's an absolutely critical and perfect question on modern music. Uh, again, Facebook, uh, social media gives people the illusion that they're famous. It's the, uh, it's kind of very Andy Warhol. Uh, you know, people think um, that because they've got lots of people telling them how good they are, that they're actually a success as a musician. You can be very, very good at something. Whether you're popular or not has nothing to do with whether you're very good at what you do, uh, or whether you're making valid, you know, art. There is nothing wrong with trying to get a big following, but I would encourage people to try to get a following by putting out content that actually genuinely means something to them. I find it very disheartening when I see young people, particularly, who they are willing to essentially strip away anything unique about themselves and just create an image online of whatever it is that will get them the most likes and the most followers. Social media literally conditions us to crave the approval of other people. The real danger, um, it's not just a danger, it's happening, is that uh, quite a few kids end up being suicidal because they lose the capacity to really interact with people on the one-to-one -one level. They have all these friends on Facebook and of course most of them are not real friends. It's just a make-believe or very, very superficial kind of thing. I'm not saying that it's not possible to become friends on Facebook or so. And Facebook has some very strong points when it comes to family, integration and communication, absolutely. I'm, I am for that, you know. But some people will display their entire life on Facebook from uh, what kind of pizza they eat to what kind of shampoo they buy and so on. And for some people, that is cool. But uh, this is not for me. Everyone just cares about like getting so many likes and only cares about like instant gratification and also um, you can't say any criticisms because criticisms are considered abusive now. So you have to like everything and give positive feedback for everything they do. And I think sometimes with creativity, a person needs to work through it. If you like promote every single thing you do the very first time you do it and you don't spend any time working on it, you're always going to be at, you know, hobby level. You're never going to be at genius level. Work at it. You need to make it long term. You know, I, I mean, I didn't do my first real photography book until like 17 years after the first image in the book. I mean, it takes takes a while. You have to let stuff percolate, too. I mean, of course, you want to keep your presence out there, but I often, like, I've got some personal projects going, and, and I don't necessarily post the best stuff on there because I want to 
reserve stuff for print for a show or a book or whatever and then you put that stuff out there when you're um taking these photos do you ever stop to think wow this is a special moment or do you not think that when you're shooting um you, you when you're shoot when you're in the middle of shooting you often um have a sense that uh this was a great moment you know i mean of course in the film days it, it took you could take you a day or a week or whatever to find out if that was true mm -hmm. even if your lighting was right um now you kind of have instant gratification speaking of which um there's a uh, Uh, oh, this is a very famous Kurt photo, right? Yeah, so this is Kurt on his shoulders at the at the um, Commodore Ballroom in Vancouver, and I mean, I had a when I took this shot, I knew there was something there. I had that that moment that like tingle up the spine, but then you just keep you keep going, and then. Uh, but when I went to develop the film, I went straight. I knew that there was something there. So he, Amazing. yeah, he did a somersault essentially. What did he think of the photo? Uh, well, he, he, they liked it enough. They put it on the back of the Smells Like Teen Spirit single, so... Really? Yeah. So when Smells Like Teen Spirit hit big, how did that affect uh, Nirvana and, by extension, the scene here? Um, well, y you know, I mean, it, it uh, just brought in a lot of work and, uh, you know, some heartache, of course, and... It, it, you know, we were in our 20s. It just kind of kept chugging along. I mean, uh, Nirvana were out of town. The band started being out of town a lot more. Um, Did you guys realize it was something special when it blew up or not till later on? Well, I mean, we knew there was something going on, but we just figured it would just collapse at any minute or, you know, years from now it would just be... Uh, you know, a few a few record collectors that would remember it all, but really, uh, yeah, I just they didn't have didn't understand that it would have some sort of longevity or fit in with the the history of music. This was at Motorsports Garage, which was like a big show, the first show when they did when all these photographers came from England, right when grunge broke in England. Part of why Kurt and Nirvana was so great was because he was a lonely kid and he sat at home in his room and spent hour after hour after hour playing guitar. What I've noticed recently with, because um, I worked with um, a bunch of younger people recently, and a lot of them are in bands, and um, some of them have the attitude of, we learned a song, we made a video, it's on YouTube, now we're rock stars. You know, it's like, wait, you barely even can play that song! So I think they're getting a different kind of attention. Like, by doing the instant gratification video, then they get everyone in their own peer group to like them, and maybe people with that mindset, but if they're trying to impress other people outside of their specific peer group, they would do better to make something that had more of a complete vision in it. And I think that that kind of art and music takes time. For me, I feel like a lot of people today think to be successful as a musician or as a filmmaker, you just have to get a lot of Instagram followers. Yeah, everyone. Yeah, it's, it's all smoke and mirrors. What are your thoughts on mainstream pop music today? That's a good question. I really, I really don't know. I, I've never really listened to newer music until Kirsten and I were on the game show, the Speed Shazam show, and I had to listen to all this new music. And I was like, everything really sounds the same. Even like the bigger kind of, I don't know, I don't even know what you would call them now, like the genre. I, I kind of call them hipster music. What do you feel about pop music today? Yeah, it's a it's that's a tough question, really, too, because I mean, some pop music, obviously, it's popular music. It's very catchy. So, I, I definitely love a good pop song when I hear it, and I can appreciate how well it's it's written and the craft that goes into it. Um, but yeah, there is a lot of that manufactured kind of element to it as well. I do tend to gravitate more towards the artists that I know are writing their own music and the ones that are actually responsible for creating their own image and and doing the, the hard yards themselves. I think you can I think you can really hear that. You can hear if somebody's put their own spirit into what they're singing or not. And we're glad to be back in Toronto this evening. So thank you all for supporting rock and roll. It's good to see some familiar faces and a bunch of new ones. So we're... You know, a lot of people on one hand they'll go, pop music is popular music. And then there's the other sort of like idea behind pop music, which is this is contrived, this is made for radio, this is made for success, this is made for, it's made to fit into a mold. And that's everything that rock and roll 
is not about. Rock and roll is about breaking the mold, about being free, about being spontaneous. Thank you very much. We're going to play one off our latest self-titled album now. I, I just tried a virtual reality headset the other day. Really? And I had this, like, thought of, wow, man, if it keeps going, pretty soon people will be able to just put on virtual reality headsets. And well, I heard they're developing a virtual reality Freddie Mercury. I just met somebody recently who told me that the hologram technology is becoming very popular. You saw Tupac at Coachella a few years ago, a virtual hologram of Tupac. I know for a fact that's being looked at and considered for development for iconic rock artists. So these guys will live on forever. What you're seeing now is artists trying to find a way to live forever. Because what they're finding is that the brand is bigger than the band. The brand is bigger than the band. More so than ever before, Musicians are able to support themselves and make a good living by being in cover bands and touring all over the world. Which to me really emphasizes the notion that for musicians today, the bulk of the money is in live shows and touring. So I'm here in the reception for Sunset Sound in Los Angeles. This is one of the most influential recording studios ever period. So right now we're going to go into one of the studios itself. So let's go check it out. Yeah, there's a, the ISO booth right here. That's awesome. Thank you, sir. So what is this room exactly? So this is where Primarily, they do vocal, you know, overdubs, and you know that way they can be separated from the band, so they don't get the, the leak into the recording. Oh, that's so cool! So here would be like the vocals, and then over there is the band. Right. So and they, then in that room, that's where, I guess, the producers would be. Yep. Engineer and assistant. And yeah. That's awesome. That's where it happened. Thanks a lot for showing me this, man. Yeah, of course. Glad you're here. Come by, come by. Can you tell if someone has recorded themselves in a professional studio or if they've just done it in their basement and had it mixed professionally? No. Because there are a lot of really terrible sound recordings that have been made in really expensive studios. Because the crucial piece of gear is the guy doing it. Hmm. Um, that's the crucial piece of equipment, is the ears of the person doing the job. So the studio itself doesn't matter, it's more... The studio do facilitates doing a good job, but that's not all you need. You need somebody who actually knows what they're doing and has some sympathy with the music and knows how to use the equipment and not be used by the equipment. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to someone then, like let's say, if they can't afford a studio and they just do it by themselves? I encourage that. You know, soundproof your basement, spend 600 bucks on Pro Tools, get a good computer, get an interface, get half a dozen microphones and just start recording yourself. That's what I did. You know, your mileage may vary. So you can do amazing recordings on your own if you have like a good mic, a good preamp, and you know what a good sound is because it's not rocket science really. I mean, it's you get a good sound at the source, you put the mic in the right place and you record it and then it's about can you do a good performance? I like even going back to recording, you know, my problem with like the newer albums and stuff is that they create this great release, but they can't play it live because it's so polished. It does, it's not raw. And yeah, it's just, I don't know, the essence of what it is to be in the band kind of gets lost in the releases that all these people put out. Good music is imperfect. Mm -hmm. And that's just that, that's a fact of the matter. And I think that the best things in music are mistakes. That they're technically Not even just wrong. perfect, just human. So in terms of mainstream popular music, my big issue is auto-tune. You guys are actually playing your instruments, you guys are actually singing. How do you feel when you hear that stuff on the radio? Well, it's, I don't want to say offended, but because, you know, I, we want to respect all kinds of music, you know, whatever it is, be diplomatic, but it's like, 
Well, when I hear a pop song on the radio, everything is absolutely spot on. The drums are right Flawless. on top of the beat. Every note is right there. Rock is a different aesthetic. And at times it becomes popular. Um, usually when there's a rock band that's very good at writing a pop song, which was what Nirvana did, um, you know, I mean, people still want verses and choruses and bridges and hooks. Guns and Roses, pop songs. Jane's Addiction, pop songs. Pearl Jam, you know, their hits, the, the big hits they've had, they're, they're written as pop songs. Um, I find that pop has a connotation to it, though, in a sense of like, mm -hmm. like those may be pops like influenced with rock and roll, but like, they're st they're still playing their instruments. They're still really singing. I feel like when people think of pop music today, it's more like the auto tune kind of stuff. It is. It's more the common kind of pop music that rules the charts, and that the major labels are more interested in promoting and signing is manufactured for the most part. You can hear the auto tune. You can hear the drum machine. I can hear the fact that it was all done on a grid. Um, and it's a completely alien aesthetic from the way I make recordings. And that's kind of what I think of when I think of Instagram, you know, is that sort of surface perfection. It's hollow. It doesn't make you feel good about yourself. A lot of people that you meet like that are more insecure than ever because they have to make sure no one ever sees their humanity or their flaws or their imperfections. And to me, that's what I love about people are their imperfections. I mean, in my photography, that's what I look for is that shared human humanity, you know, because that is our human imperfections. And to me, that's what I care about. Good music is imperfect. Mm -hmm. And that's just that that's a fact of the matter. And I think that the best things in music are mistakes. They're technically Not even just wrong. perfect, just human. Yeah, just human. The great songs in the past few years have been like, like Adele, like some of some of those songs she goes in that top register and her oh, yeah. voice breaks out. Oh yeah, her yeah. voice will crack and you know, and, and it's sure like, that's not the best taste. That's what keeps it human, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. like he's it's human. like uh, Josier, uh, Josier's another stuff like that. One. Just like instruments, you know, human. I feel like one of the things about rock and roll that makes it so awesome is that human mistake element. That's what I like about it, you know, and when you go to a concert, when I go to a concert and I hear that mistake, I, I like it. Like, I think, I think it's great. Like, I, I want to hear the mistakes. There is a kind of a, an appeal to authenticity for people who uh, cling to rock music, right? Like that that dude is actually drumming, that dude is actually playing the guitar, and you can't fake virtuosity. There is always a professional tier of musicians, like people who are insubstantial as artists and who don't have any closely held beliefs and don't have a core set of ideas that they're committing to as artists. There are always going to be people like that, that the professional mainstream music business can fashion into figureheads and exploit. I think that dismissing an era of music as being a superficial era or being a, an insubstantial era mistakes this mainstream tier of fluff for the whole of music when in in reality the whole of music is extremely deep and as you get deeper into your particular tastes you find more and more value in it more and more of interest i cannot take seriously the idea that music is now not good or that music is now not serious or not substantial or that the there are not people trying to express themselves because I see them every day. That is my that is my entire client base. I would have closed up shop a long time ago if that if those people didn't exist. That's awesome. Thank you. Super cool. Look at that. Man. That's a really high ceiling. Yeah, how high are these ceilings? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Do you know if the acoustics in this room have been pretty much the same? Oh yeah, everything's, I think even the, 
removing rafters are original. Really? Nothing that I know of has been changed in here. Got a basketball net. Yeah, that's three back there with that one. That's three? Yeah. That's the purple rain room? You should be able to fit most of your jumps. Oh, yeah. Let's see. But you might need to take cool. it. And we're back to Studio One. I think because of the ease and the speed at which we're able to produce things today, we've, in a sense, forgotten the art of patience. You know, taking your time with something, letting it grow and develop. All the great bands, like, for example, Led Zeppelin and Stairway to Heaven. When Stairway to Heaven first came out, it was not really, like, people weren't blown away by it. Same with Bohemian Rhapsody. You know, but these songs have stood the test of time and they've become legendary. Led Zeppelin was not critically acclaimed, okay, but yeah, yeah. Know, fans loved them. We know how that changed. Yeah. <laughs> and, and music, you know, some of the most popular bands, uh, uh, lots of times, just like the one I'm connected to, Kiss, was never really liked by many of the critics, too. Do you feel this back there? In 1991, Metallica released their monstrously successful Black Album. Stupid question. Are you alive? When Metallica first released the Black Album, they got a lot of criticism. A lot of people within the metal community said that they had sold out, that they had gone too commercial, they've abandoned their metal roots, so to speak. Where do you draw the line between selling out and expressing yourself artistically? If you are a struggling musician and you're trying to make money to support yourself, in that case, do what you have to do. A lot of people are pointing at the fact that Metallica are not struggling. They were not struggling at the time. So why did they have to change? Why did they have to go more commercial? Is going commercial necessarily selling out? I don't think so. I think you can tell clearly when someone's totally abandoned their artistic integrity and they're just doing it for money. So where is the line between selling out and being an artist and growing. Where is that line? A sellout to me would be doing something you don't want to do just for money. That means you're selling out of what you want to do. You're doing this other thing because you just want to make money. Um, you don't want to do it, but you're going to do it because you want to make money. So um, I'm pretty sure, you know, watching documentaries on Metallica and the Black Album, they wanted to do that record. So I would I would never call Metallica sellouts for doing the Black Album. Um, I think it also just comes from people who just preferred Master of Puppets or, you know, Injustice for All. Obviously Metallica transcended it all, but they didn't even make their first video until the Injustice record. The folklore about them, the, the people tell their friends and their kids and it just the, the the legend grows. Do you think that rock could ever come back into the mainstream, or is it still going to be a huge thing, but just on the outskirts? I think it still is in the mainstream. It's just not in the mainstream on the radio. Like I, th I still think. I bet you, if you look at Spotify um, statistics, I bet you there's millions and millions of people streaming hard rock, heavy metal songs, punk songs on Spotify right now. So I think it's super popular. I just don't think that people um, hear it if they switch on the radio as much. And so that's, I don't think radio dictates the mainstream anymore. I don't think there's any one mainstream at the moment. You know, there's always going to be like a superficial pop music idiom. There will always be that tier of music, of insubstantial, nonsensical, content-free pop music, right? There is also always a tier of dedicated, committed artists who are doing things to satisfy their creative impulse and for whom the music means the world, right? There will always be interesting rock bands. They may not be elevated to that pop star status ever again, but that doesn't particularly bother me because that's not the only way to find music. If I may ask, is it a different approach um, when you're working with someone like, let's say, Robert Plant compared to like the indie artists you work with? Do you approach things differently? I, I believe that I give everybody the same degree of credit and I take everybody's music seriously. So if I'm working with somebody who has notoriety, then there might be more pressure on them. They might have some expectations in terms of my deference and I don't want to insult somebody by not being deferential, for example. So 
when I was working with Jimmy Page and Robert Plant, obviously I'm working with people of extraordinary stature with a lot of experience. So I feel like I have to treat them with a, a degree of deference that that pays respect to their experience and their expectations. There's no question that there's still artists that come around that could move the needle. They'll always be an outlet for, uh, you know, musicians or artists that do things that are extreme to really excite people. Yeah, that, that'll never change. In terms of young, new rock bands, one that's been getting a lot of attention in particular is Greta Van Fleet. How's everybody doing? I always say that um, if people are giving us the responsibility, we'll take it. And um, I think that's really all there is to it. We, we, we just want to play music, we want to make music that we want to hear ourselves. Yeah, it's, I mean, we've been, we've been doing it up to this point. I, I can't imagine what it would take to actually deter us from that, you know? <laughs> It's, so I guess I guess the answers will find out. And yeah, see what happens. it's why we all started doing it. We were absolutely a garage band, and the reason we were a garage band is because we loved to play together and we loved to play music. And it, as long as you hold on to that, you shouldn't be. You know, you you find yourself not getting nervous because you know you're just doing what you love to do, and it's truly natural at that point. You know, you, there are a lot of these issues just are eliminated. If there's one thing about you guys, either as musician or as people that you want the world to know, but people haven't really talked about yet. What is it about you? Man. I know it's a curveball question. That is but quite the curveball. <laughs> and we gotta be careful what we say. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is for the future, right here. Um, I think, um, I think Greta Van Fleet stands for a lot more than just, um, just music. And I, I, don't, I think it's beyond me. I think it's beyond any of us. I think it's all of us together. And I think it's all the people who, you know, the fans. And I think that uh, when you combine all the factors, there's a, there's a certain sense of love and unity, whether it be, a, you know, a headline show or, or whatever it is. I think in that room or that stage or that sound, the, everything, the sonic, it just rises up. And I think people kind of make this orb of love and I think that's what we need right now. A lot of us are taking a lot of the influences that we had from rock music and incorporating it into electronic music now. Um, a lot of people are starting to add a lot of live instruments and things to electronic music now too. And I feel like maybe that's not the rock you know more acoustic but I feel like Ed Sheeran in a way is still like with the guitar based music and it's still one of the biggest songs in the world, you know? And uh, I think you have like Dean Lewis and Alec Benjamin right now that are also like guitar-based, band, ba sort of band-based music. You were telling me earlier that you're a fan of Jimi Hendrix. Has Jimi Hendrix influenced you in any way? Jimi Hendrix, the thing that made Jimi Hendrix Jimi Hendrix is, is his, his whole style. His fashion approach is just edgy, like, man, I'm Jimi Hendrix. It's the way home, look at the camera, you know it's, this is his show. When he got on stage, it was his show. So a lot, like when I see artists like Jimi Hendrix and Elvis and the Beatles and Pac, like people like that, you see them touch stages, they own it. And that's, that's what I can grab from legends like Jimi Hendrix. Own the stage. Do you think there could ever be a new rock and roll artist that gets to the level of Jimi Hendrix? Or are those days over? I can't say that. Rock never over. Music don't never die. It's, nah, it definitely will be somebody that's bigger than him. Awesome. Def definitely. Why do you think people are saying rock is dead? I, I, I think that the, the whole... That started when people started realizing that rock is falling from the forefront. And it's like... For a time, you know, like rock, rock and roll is everything that anybody ever listened to. Where, where would you roughly place the origins of rock and roll? Like I would forties, thirties. Yeah, I would. I would. You know, yeah, goes back that far. That's a long time. There's a lot. That's this world has changed quite a bit since then. He smashed his drum like a little toy, and he happens to be the birthday boy.
it's a different world. I get to relive my career vicariously through my son. I have a 19-year-old son who's a drummer and in, in his own band. I think he's able to learn from a lot of the things I went through. Um, and it's a different world, you know, like the way I had to do it 30 years ago, um, he's got to do it very differently these days for all the reasons that we're talking about here. It's just a completely different world. The internet is the biggest, biggest part of it. So you just kind of have to, you know, roll with the punches and change with the times. It's almost like if, you, if we can go in a time capsule and then Led Zeppelin can do like their first or second or third album again, what would they be, you know? It's very easy for new generations to to discover Led Zeppelin and the Beatles and all the great guitar groups, which they seem to do, even though, let's be real, the music industry, if you only go by numbers, and numbers don't lie, it's, it's very weak. If you go by live gigging, rock guitar and bands that represent that do very well. Okay, so we're talking about two different things. I believe bands will always have a market to make a very good living and to get a lot of recognition. But because everything is so widespread, it's harder to become a singular voice, so to speak, that defines a generation. How do you get to that level in today's marketplace? There can only be one Beatles. You know, what happened, what happened for Elvis can only ever happen once. And then the Beatles came around and you had four Elvises and then they changed everything. And, you know, when things were, when music was happening in the 50s, 60s and 70s, things were being done for the first time. But now that, you know, now that we're 50 years into rock, what could still be done that hasn't been done? All I know is that uh, I live in a rock music environment, uh, predominantly, and um, it doesn't seem that dead to me. You know, people are coming to the concerts, they're traveling long distance, hundreds of miles to see a band. Um, so how can it be dead? Maybe it's not as new as it was in 1969 at the time of Woodstock or whatever, and or in the early 60s or in the early 70s, or at the time of the Beatles. Of course, that, that was more exciting because it was the first time these sounds were there. Now, it's um, in some cases more of the same, people doing the same again and again. In the beginning, when a journey starts, when something gets discovered, it's red hot, it's red, it's orange, it's all that, but it's also wild and dangerous. Rock used to be like that. In the days of um, even with the Beatles who were like forerunners for all this then Cream Hendrix came you know Led Zeppelin rock was dangerous and and I remember what it sounded like you know uh, it sounded different back then although they were the same notes but we had never heard anything like that that was new you picked up a guitar you could come up with things that had never been done before how exciting there's not much ground to break anymore by the way it's just how you mix it up if the Beatles had come out today, do you think they'd be as big as they would have been? In the sense that there are so many artists today that have literally billions of hits on YouTube, mm -hmm. but I feel like they'll be forgotten. It's like, do you think it would have been the same with the Beatles? Um, this cultural thing that I mentioned earlier, how this, the times were needing heroes, I don't want to in any way diminish what I think is an incredible uh, catalog of material and the way the Beatles, how we grew with them. But I don't really think um, a band, if there was a version of the Beatles that came out now that, that could do great music, it would be quite the same impact. There was, there was so much going on in, the, in our history of the world that made the Beatles important. And hence, where Frank Sinatra kind of had, had to look at what was happening in the 60s and realize that coming out in a suit with his buddies as the Rat Pack, you know, and having a hell of a time and being king of the world, um, all of a sudden just didn't seem as relevant. You know what I mean? Culture changes. The marketplace changes. We live in a world today that is more interconnected than ever before. As such, even a niche market can have a global outreach. 
I think it is truly important for artists who are trying to make a name for themselves to possibly consider expanding their musical vocabulary and embracing different cultures. Many of the greatest artists have done this. In the late 60s, for example, the Beatles famously lived in India for a period of time, and their music was heavily influenced by Indian culture. The Beatles wrote 48 songs in India. Jack and Dino, Produttore e Ingeniero, Melhor Album de Rock o de Musica Alternativa in Lingua Portuguesa 2017 or uh, for Jardim Pomar by the artist Nando Race. So that's what these things look like. And, that's uh, amazing. You know, the funny thing is... No you know, way, they come comes, off. Yeah, it comes apart. <laughs> <laughs> is that the same You're not supposed to do that. I wow, know. that's funny. <laughs> yeah, it is funny. I'm an engineer. I take things apart, and then I put them together again. Did you learn that by accident? Or I did, what? actually. The thing just came unscrewed one day. I've been to Brazil several times. I've been to Chile many times i've been to argentina and what seems to have been in common is that um all these countries had military dictatorships and these were kind of controlled societies where you know the music that was available to them on on you know commercial radio and of course this was before the internet um was kind of controlled all you could hear was the safe stuff and when these various dictatorships fell um the young people suddenly had the whole history of pop, you know, the whole history of rock and roll suddenly was available to them. And, um, like, for instance, in Chile, when Pinochet fell, I was told this by a young Chileno, uh, some of the first music they heard was the Seattle music that I was doing here, like Nirvana, Mud Honey, that sort of thing. And... Um, it made a big impression on them. It was sort of the sound of freedom, if you will. So they love their rock and roll in South America because it's the sound of dictatorships falling. If you were still in music but not rock and roll, is there another genre you would have explored? Well, throughout my life, I've just like, I've bounced around in different genres. Like right in the last like couple of years, I've really gotten into folk music. So, but you know, when I was in my twenties, I I probably hated. I didn't even know what folk music. Well, I knew what folk music was, but I was like, that'd be the furthest thing that I'd ever listened to. As I got into my like uh, mid thirties, folk music became like I was like, this stuff's amazing. So right now, I'd probably go more into that like alt country folk. <laughs> Growing up, we were all exposed to the John Denver, the Peter Paul and Mary, the Bob Dylan, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, and all the all the capillaries of that work. And, and I think that this is what, kind of what we grew up on. And a lot of the time, people ask, and it's kind of weird because it's not really to us. It doesn't really make sense. They say, "Why did you decide you wanted to play rock music?" And we go. We didn't really decide that. It just kind of happened. That's, yeah. the, that's the sound that's generated when we're all put together. We play all types of music. We do. We don't just we play, play rock and roll music. <laughs> we play all types of music. Country and western. I'm, I'm from South Africa, man. I'm from the continent of Africa. Um, if you're from that place, you can't shake the influence, you know, the Africanness in you. You know, my cultural heritage, yes, I, I do come from Germany, but most of the time I've lived in England in my life. I have German thinking patterns that I grew up with. English um, thinking patterns are completely different, and as I'm sure, Armenian thinking patterns are different. It's not just the thinking patterns, it's uh, the emotional patterns, everything. It's like a, like a filter. So I'm sure the Armenian tree has grown through this centuries or thousands of years, and it's got its own brand of you know mental and psychic genetics all combined into one and that's of course the same with the german english and i i do find that fascinating does your background ever influence your music mm, a little bit i think rhythmically you know it helps the pocket of north africa touring around the world and then you see like some records work there some records work here but i like to make music that works around the world and you know, I'm not like, oh, I have to make one specific genre. I want to have fun with it, you know. It's similar to food, right? Italian can be your favorite kitchen, but sometimes you also want some Chinese food. 
My cultural background is Armenian. Okay. You ever worked in Armenia by any chance? I haven't, and I haven't ever. You're always heard, welcome. I've never heard from anyone from Armenia. Well, now you, you have. Know? Okay, perfect, perfect. <laughs> you know, there must be some rock bands there that need some mastering. I speak, read, and write Armenian fluently. Both my parents are Armenian. My great grandparents were survivors of the Armenian genocide. Being Armenian is a big part of who I am. And specifically, when it comes to Armenian musical heritage, there's one instrument in particular which. I would argue is the definitive Armenian instrument. This is an Armenian duduk. It's an Armenian woodwind instrument, and it's frequently used by the major film studios in Hollywood for their scores and various other artists. An Armenian duduk is featured in the soundtracks for Game of Thrones, Pirates of the Caribbean. Avatar, Gladiator, Star Trek, and many, many more. I've got one. Yeah, I've got, I've got a Duduk, yeah. It's a monster of a thing to play. Do you ever incorporate elements of world music into your songwriting? Yeah, since we did like the Fourth Legacy, Karma Records, we always infused New Age elements, whether it be Greek ideas, Celtic. On the new record, for example, we have some more Eastern European stuff, like Russian style. When you're traveling and you see and experience these different cultures, to be able to include that is, is, is pretty cool. What advice would you give to a young artist? This is something that has stood the test of time. Um, uh, the, the apprenticeship of being the musician. You have to get out there. You have to sweat it out. You have to sleep in bushes and in phone boxes. You have to really suffer um, to to satisfy uh, the muse, really, without sounding too pretentious and pompous. You've got to really want to do it. You've got to really want to be a musician. It's it's kind of a constant struggle, really, to get there because you never know. There's never a set path. You can't just go to university and get your degree and come out and go right now. I can work as a musician. It doesn't it doesn't work like that. For me, it's been constant, um, just constant knocking on doors and constant writing, working as a terrible waitress, as I mentioned before, and doing other things on the side to support making music. Every musician that I knew that was a peer of mine, that was a friend of mine, that I admired, the people who were my heroes and my inspiration, they all had day jobs, every one of them, right? I was in a band for years, I am in a band now, I'm a, I consider myself something of a musician, but also my straight job is that I'm a recording engineer, and that's true for a lot of my peers as well. Whenever I was playing music, the red light was always on, as we used to say. Uh, I was used to always having some recording thing going on, or there's just a mic hanging from the wall, anything. You, you didn't have any proof that that you had actually played music if there wasn't a recording of it. You know, I had to have proof that I was actually maybe possibly becoming a musician. To me, I think when you, when you approach something as a professional, in a profession of, your, of a lot of work or what you're doing, you just know what you came in for and came in doing. Hard times, bad times, losses, doubts, hate, but all wounds heal. And it just depends on how fast you heal. It just depends on how much you can intake. But you should be, you should automatically be prepared for it because it's coming. Every day we do a meet and greet and we meet fans and they tell us about a song that might have helped them or saved them. So I find that responsibility very important. As a person, you can sit down and and think to yourself, I'm actually good at what I do, you know, and then never seek the reason why, you know, and for me, I think I, I kind of like seek the reason and I, I, I understood, you know, that the greatness is not for me, but it's for me to share it. And I always think about that when I meet other people and they talk about how some of our music might have helped them. And I totally get that, you know, that's why I think it's really important what we do sometimes, you know. When I was uh, 12 years old, my father passed away, and then I got moved to live with an aunt, and it was, like, super crappy, you know? What was it about rock music and metal that drew you towards that sound during that time in your life? You know, like, you know how it is, like, some kids that are kind of outsiders, so I think I was gravitated to that, that um, 
sort of outsider type of music. The thing about rock and roll that is always connected with me is how loyal the fans are. People who love rock music generally end up loving it for their whole lives. For that reason, the fact that rock and roll has such a deep connection to so many people, I don't think rock and roll is ever going to die. Thank you so much for your time, guys. I really appreciate it. I do have one last request. On Friday after your concert, I found this $20 bill on the floor. I asked around, nobody said it was there, so I was wondering if you could sign it for me. Yeah, cool. of course. That's well, it's your lucky day. You, man, you, wow. Yeah, so. I haven't actually signed one of these bills yet. Yeah, they're they're interesting. It's not, uh, it's not the American style. Ooh. Ah! Hold on. Uh -oh. We need to. Sharpie. Uh, Sharpie. We need to get this thing flowing a little bit. Trials and tribulations go. of being a rock star. Yeah. Alrighty. It's rough. It's, rough. it's, just, it's Strike two. Will it happen? Do, 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 do. Oh, sort of. Hey, that's good enough. Oh, I finished <laughs> it. Fantastic. Like you that. know what? There's a D. That's a D. for Danny. Mm -hmm. And there's a, like, a W in there a little bit also. Okay, let's see how this goes. Good job, man. I'll sign. Well, it's just a, okay, we're good. Oh, try nice and soft. Oh, it's breaking. <laughs> there's the S, and there's the K. And there is the... I'm surprised they got that much out of mine. <laughs> K. It's, it's those drummer hands, right? See that? That's SK right there. Perfect. Sam Kiska. Awesome. Thank you I so much for your time, guys. I, I, I vouch I signed that. Yeah, you got yeah, it. too. Perfect. Thanks for your time, guys. Absolutely, Appreciate it. man. Next time we just have to remember. Sharp. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Thank you.